Hello. Uh, on the 16th of April each year, uh, the World Voice Day happens. And uh, we wanted to uh, make a little tribute to that event. The World Voice Day is celebrated all around the globe with uh, um, different types of vocal uh, um, happenings. And this is going to be one of them. And uh, here we are, three of us, good friends. Uh, I am Johan Sundberg, Stockholm, Sweden. And you? I am Filipa La, UNED, Madrid, Spain. I am Brian Gill at the Jacob School of Music in Bloomington, Indiana. Okay. So that is that. And now I will uh, shift the microphone uh, and put on a mask. And the mask will be to do what, Johan? The mask, I can help because he's changing the equipment. The mask <laughs> is to show in real time the waveform of the voice of the voice source, which is the transglottal airflow that passes through the glottis and makes your vocal folds vibrate. Yeah, so for, for the first time seeing this, uh, this demonstration back in, I think, 2010 or something, uh, I was so impressed with how it shows you what you're doing at your vocal fold, the level of the vocal folds. So it's a wonderful, wonderful visual. So now, Johan is holding a mask with a pressure uh, flow trans, uh, transducer in it, in a hole that the mask has, and he will share his screen with us to show you a computer program made by Svante Grankvist, our good friend and voice researcher, also at KTH and Karolinska Institute. And that software allows you to show you in real time the transglottal airflow that passes through the glottis, as I said before. It is aptly named glottis. Yeah, it is named glottis. And what it uh, shows now is the airflow that I produce when I produce uh, some speech sound. But uh, I could also take away the contributions of the vocal tract to the sound. And then we see what the vocal fold uh, system is delivering into the vocal tract. So, and then I choose my favorite viral, which is... Uh, and that is kind of uh, speech-like. But you could, I could also vary the uh, sound that is produced by the vocal fold vibration. And then uh, you, I could do it in a breathy way. Huge flow pulse. Said? A very large flow pulse. Yes, large flow pulse. And then the bottom part of the flow pulse it's round because the vocal folds never meet. They don't cut off the airstream. The airstream is constantly flowing. I'll Here tell you when is the closed phase and when is the open phase according to your cursor. Yes. Uh, closed phase. Closed phase. And now... Uh, open phase where the airflow passes. That's why there is a peak in the waveform. Yeah. I, unfortunately, I need to take a breath every now and then, but that is very common among people. Okay. Now, so what I, type of phonation were you doing, Johan? That was kind of speech-like neutral phonation. And uh, is that, that, does that involve very much glottal adduction or how, how, how do you, it, how do you it, um, coordinate uh, the, the three physiological parameters that uh, uh, are uh, very important for the, the quality of the voice source? Well, pitch is uh, one thing and I could control that. And then uh, I have the loudness. Uh, so I could vary the loudness and you could see what happens uh, with the waveform. So the the airflow goes up when the sound uh, intensity increases. Yes, and the flow pulses end more abruptly uh, when the loudness is high. 
the steepness of the trailing end of the pulses. That's it. And uh, what? And what would happen if you went too far with the uh, increase in glottal adduction? Uh, I reach my limit, and then it doesn't grow anymore. <laughs> okay, and then pitch, of course. Uh, okay, but now let's uh, see what uh, what the third dimension is, and that is. Uh, when you uh, have switched from breathy uh, to neutral to pressed. I start with breathy. Okay. And Very nice between. demonstration. Very nice. And when breathy, uh, between breathy and neutral, there is one phonation that we call flow phonation. And it is characterized by huge uh, pulses, air pulses. Uh, so I start with neutral. Uh, there's a little wiggle in the closed space, and I could get rid, rid of that by adjusting the, um, the um, filter here. That's so beautiful. That. So the window on the left side of the Glotti software corresponds to the anti-filters or, or the, the anti-formants that you put so that you, you kill the effects of the vocal tract on the voice source waveform. Is that true? Yeah. Yes, that is more than true. That is very true. And Sorry, Svante this... is a genius. Yes, yeah. it is. Uh, and the two dots there correspond to the anti resonances of the first, first and the second. The first one and the second one. This is the second formant, and this is the first formant, the second vocal tract, and the first vocal tract resonance. So that is it. And Brian, will you agree that the formants are resonances of the vocal tract or a peak on the spectrum? They are resonances of the vocal tract. An old definition was a peak in the spectrum. Amen. Amen. <laughs> and another question, Johan. When you vary from flow to uh, a pressed and then to breathy phonation and neutral phonation, do you uh, vary also the effort you are uh, making at the, um, uh, at the level of the glottis, you think? Uh, uh, yeah, it is a question of squeezing the uh, vocal folds. Um, and you see, they don't let very much air through when they are pressed together. Then I feel that I'm very generous with the airflow. It takes a lot of air, but it also gives a lot of sound. And yeah, really that will have a consequence on voice vocal health and voice training. Uh, what, uh, how do you see this? Yeah, when you do press phonation and the, the flow pulse really flattens out, um, then you, you end up, the only way to do that would be to have a compression of tissue at the vocal fold level. And that compression of tissue is going to be increased friction and friction is the enemy of that tissue, and that's what can lead to voice disorders. Uh, mm -hmm. So flow phonation will be the goal for a healthy voice production. Yeah, absolutely. In order to allow that much flow through, the vocal folds have to be in a position where they minimize friction. Mm. But I have lots of people asking, well, if I use always flow phonation in, for example, uh, musical theater or jazz, um, people get bored because the voice quality will be always the same. So could uh, uh, we use press phonation uh, without causing harm to our voice? How, how do you see this? The, for me? Yeah. Yeah, I think that, uh, I think in any genre, there are minor changes that can occur, mm. uh, both at the vocal fold level um, and at the acoustic level, the way you're tuning the vocal track mm. that, that give you the aesthetic that we all know as a particular style, a language of a style, so to speak. And so I think that 
within every genre. I have used my flow mask and inverse filter, and you can have a pretty high flow pulse and have that the connected sound that's in, indicative of some pop and belt sounds. Yeah. You can have a much higher uh, pulse than people initially lead with. So I think that this this particular configuration could uh, could exist in any genre that I've seen so far. And this goes in the lines with what you say, Johan, and the importance of the uh, fun, the pulse uh, the, of the um, of the voice source, the amplitude of the vibration of the vocal folds, and how much air passes through. Um, can you talk about more about uh, uh, the importance of the of the voice source fundamental and its amplitude? Yeah, yeah it is. Uh like that that uh, the uh, pul the amplitude of the pulses uh, uh, they are directly determining how loud the lowest partial of the voice is so when i go to flow phonation i have a strong lowest partial the fundamental is strong uh, and you could hear also that the sound is a bit uh, dark perhaps and when i say uh, you could almost uh, imagine that it, uh, my voice is coming from a rather small loudspeaker that is not so gifted, that is, that, that is unable to emit low frequency tones. Wonderful. Philippa, yes. do, you have, do you have a way to sh teach people flow phonation? Yes, with a flow ball. Uh, the flow ball is a small tool like this. It uh, has a tube with a hole in it square but then it attaches to a basket that is like that and then with a small uh, uh, hole in it and you attach both things and you put the ball and the ball height gives you a direct indi indication of the amount of uh, uh, liters per second passes the glottis yes johan Yo. The flow is actually the force that lifts the ball. Or yes. flow, the higher the ball goes in the air. Exactly. So for uh, um, I've done this, a, a study with Svanta and Greta Witzbach and uh, Pedro uh, Andrade that uh, showed that if you uh, uh, lift the ball uh, using uh, uh, 0 0.4 liters per second, uh, you could uh, have a ball height of uh, five uh, centimeters. So you need, for five centimeters, you need 0 0.4 liters per second. Uh, but to lift up the, bo the, the, the flow from uh, the, the ball from, from the basket, you only need 0 0.2 liters per second, which is the amount of flow that you normally use in neutral phonation. So this really, by lifting more and more the, the ball, you can uh, uh, increase more and more the flow. Of course, you adjust that according to the person you have in front of you, the sex, the age, and the need. But it's a very neat way of doing it. I will put myself facing that uh, whole wall so that you see what I'm going to do. And uh, um, a suggestion of Johan, I will do press formation first without the flow ball and then with the flow ball and then you hear and you see what happens to the ball. So I don't have enough uh, flow to lift up the ball, but if I am more generous with it, you can see that I lift it more. So this is a, a very uh, direct way of showing the attention and paying attention to only one aspect when you are phonating, that is the flow you use to phonate. So it's quite nice. But I know, Brian, that you use very specific exercises with the same purpose, but without a tool. Could you tell us more about that? So, on. The flow ball is exceedingly expensive to buy. No, uh, uh, I don't have any uh, deal with any company. Uh, they are sell for many de different prices depending on when you are going to buy it from. But I can ensure you that you don't pay more than $10 for it. 
uh, the, the the most expensive because they are cheaper than that. Deluxe. You should <laughs> the deluxe. Yes. You should have a deal with that, Philippa. You you sell it well. I think it's a great tool. It's a great tool for singing. How do you t uh, convince people? How do you pr provoke uh, avoidance of press and furthering um, flow phonation? Yeah. So well, I say first of all, if you the flow ball is such a great example because. You, you can feel the changes and you can see the changes with the, with the height of the ball. It's just, it's great. It gives you a visual and, and also a physiological sensation. Um, it's really lovely. Uh, but if you don't have a flow ball, then a lot of the traditional uh, exercises can be helpful, but you really have to do them in a way that is effective. Uh, so for example, the lip trill, that's existed for a very long time. But I go around the world teaching people and I suggest, hey, do you use a lip trill? And they're like, oh, yeah, all the time. And then uh, they give me an example of their lip trill and they go. <laughs> I'm like, OK, uh, that's not going to help very much. Um, so for me, I pay attention to if I use a lip trill, I pay attention to the evenness and ease of vibration at the level of the lips. And why is and that? because that ease and evenness of vibration is reflected in ease and evenness of vibration at the vocal fold level. And so if, if you have a nice even <clears throat> buzz at the level of the lips, then you can assume that there, you have a nice even vibration at the level of the vocal folds. And that's verified by the person's sensation. Without me saying anything, their reaction is, that's so much easier. So one way I do it is to isolate the vibration and make sure that the lips are looser in the middle and a little more taut on the, the corners. And so I usually have the people stretch out and look ridiculous for a moment and stretch out the lips and then leave them out like a duck bill or a selfie face. So once you're in that position, I often have them so their mind's eye is not distracted by vibration anywhere else. I have them touch their face so that their mind's eye will sense the vibration in the middle of the lips. <clears throat> Instead of... Could you uh, turn so that we could see the profile? And if you do it like this, it's like a sprinkler. <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> it actually, well, in, in all seriousness, doing it like that with your head from side to side can really ensure bilateral activation of musculature. So it's a good way of getting a person to, to sing in a more coordinated way with the strap muscles um, acting as an elastic Oh, You also have the raspberry. Yes, the raspberry too. So I'll finish with the, the lip trill, the, the evenness of vibration here. If a person is, uh, one thing that you need to look out for is constriction, pharyngeal constriction where they're and the person will not sense that to be energy right in the middle of the lips. Still feels like it's stuck back here. So what, so what you want is, uh, if we could quantify, would be like the, the most you can get of resistance of, to the airflow in the lips and not somewhere else, right? Uh, it's it's the right amount. So I would say you could overly resist at the level of the lips by going okay. That's too much resistance there and it makes the flow pulse very uneven or the, the flow very uneven And so you want to find a sweet spot of resistance if you didn't resist enough That doesn't work either so it's a pretty robust vibration, but very easy and very even. And the amplitude of the lips, you can uh, use your cell phones that have the slow motion, and you can see the amplitude of the lips increase or decrease based on the wrong amount of resistance. So, and, and too low, correct. And does it change that uh, the, the velocity of the lip trill with pitch? Yes, yes because the flow, the flow is going to change. So as you go up, the, this will increase. So if you're at the bottom, as opposed to much faster vibration up there than at the bottom. Yeah, good point. And then the raspberry, 
which is just fun to do. <laughs> you spit all over the place. And again, in a time like uh, we're in now, do not do these in front of anyone else nope. or else you'll be spreading potential virus, which is the scariest thing. So also we should say, we hope, uh, we wish everyone well during this crazy time. Yeah. Um, but a raspberry is the tongue out and there's an upper lip and a lower lip raspberry. Upper lip is where the tongue comes straight out. And it vibrates your upper lip. And it's pretty much only your upper lip vibrating with minor, minor movement of the tongue, which you can tell by touching your tongue. It actually doesn't affect the vibration. So you know that it's mostly upper lip. So you're not gonna need as much air to do that. With a lower lip, it's both your tongue and your lower lip vibrating. So your tongue comes out down diagonally. And you're moving a lot of tissue. It'll stop when you touch your tongue. Is there any difference in, in uh, uh, the aim that uh, you said previous for these exercises to use the uh, upper lip vibration or the lower lip vibration? Yeah, both, uh, both will increase the flow. Uh, and by, uh, by requiring that you release resistance at the level of the vocal folds in order to vibrate adequately at the lips or tongue and lip. And they um, are so both, 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 will, both will do that and both are good, but I have found that it requires more air to do a raspberry. So because what we talked about earlier, you need more air and higher frequencies, the raspberry seems to be well suited for higher frequencies. There's also a resonance component uh, that we need to look into, but it's a change in the contour of the tongue position, which seems to be um, uh, efficient and more advantageous in higher pitches as well, uh, particularly for women. Uh, um, and the lip drill, yeah, the lip drill is a little bit, uh, it requires a little less air because it's a little less tissue to vibrate, but it also is easier to sense the, the sound being more forward, uh, which is, um, I think, an important sensation. It's one that we rely on, although it has not been adequately defined uh, with scientific experiment. So I think that's another thing that the voice world has to focus on. So let's get on it, people. Go team. In, in regulating the uh, glottal flow, if you go to breathy or prestonation, that uh, how much you squeeze the vocal folds. And, uh, I have noticed that many people who are not so used to what the voice is doing, they don't know what glottal uh, closing is. So right. then I just say them that, uh, tell them that when I do this, uh, I open and close the glottis. <laughs> and realize that you could uh, close that very forcefully as when you are carrying a piano or, piano or something uh, or very very softly uh, like that uh, so uh, glottis is uh, an important function to uh, be a uh, friend with uh, if you should uh, teach your voice to uh, be uh, less pressed of course, yes. but, but the thing is that you have to regulate the three physiological parameters you were talking about, the subglottal pressure, the tension of the vocal folds and the glottal adduction, right? And I was going to ask, Johan, why is that so bad for the vocal folds to have an amplitude so uh, um, to vibrate under a pressed condition? Is that because the collision forces are bigger or because the collision forces are more confined to one single portion of the vocal folds? How do you see it? I think when you are uh, exaggerating the glottal adduction, you press the vocal folds together and they won't like to separate. So they, if, if they are forced by the high subglottal pressure that you need to apply, uh, then they fly against uh, while if you uh, in reduce glottal adduction they make bigger uh, excursions and they don't collide with such a great uh, impact force nice that's important lessening the impact force and also the the inherent friction in that. Yeah. yeah 
and uh, that uh, um, reminds me something. So, and uh, the this theme of the World Voice Day of to, uh, this year is uh, listen to your voice. What kind of things should we listen when we are getting into trouble with the amount of uh, glottal adduction we have? Yeah. Uh, it is some kind of a, a timbral effect. I don't know how to describe it. I know it is the amplitude of the, the lowest partial in the spectrum, the fundamental. Uh, and to me, it gives a kind of roundness and relaxedness of the voice quality. So it's uh, like this. Uh, it doesn't sound energetic and pressed and forced like this. So. Uh, um, so it yeah. does also relate a little bit also with the fundamental frequency you speak in. Because if I speak like that, uh, I increase my fundamental frequency and I also increase my glottal adduction, right? Yeah, that is the thing with singing and singers. They can be uh, allowed to co-vary, necessarily co-vary the glottal dimensions. Mm -hmm. if increase vocal loudness, they should not automatically increase vocal fold adduction, pressiveness. And if they go to difficult high notes, they are not supposed to uh, automatically go into pressed phonation. Mm -hmm. You need to make the three dimensions, loudness, pitch, and um, phonation type independent of each other so that they could do whatever they like like uh, 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 other instrument um, players la do. Like so that the instrument sounds equally in timbre in the bottom and in the right, in the, in the higher part, right? When you sing forte or if you sing pianissimo, right? Yeah, exactly, yes. Like a clarinet, it doesn't sound like a flute when it's up in the high pitches and like a bassoon when it's in low pitches. It's always a clarinet, right? And mm -hmm. Brian, what do you think about Mesa di Voce exercises for this uh, um, mastering of the, uh, separately these three parameters that control your, your voice? Do you think um, that they are being forget, for, forgotten in, voice, in the voice studio? Um, I think that they are invaluable once a person gets to some level of coordination. So I, I think that they could be overused if you're working with a novice uh, singer. Uh, then they'll find a way to get quiet and get louder, but it won't necessarily be the most efficient. So I think you, you're really looking for a degree of efficiency first before you start to articulate more, uh, more difficult tasks. What I was going to say before, though, that I think there's an obsession with listening to voice these days. Um, and I find that your ability to listen for balanced sounds within in each individual requires a lifetime of involvement in listening. And I, I don't think that there's, there, there's a way to uh, train that and get it started. But the fact of the matter is you have to live with it year after year after year after student after student after student. Whereas there's a physical coordination that you could be shooting for that thankfully when you do it decrease get rid of excess resistance here and get a resonance sensation that feels free and easy and buzzy that will result in each individual's natural sustainable most musical timbre uh effect and i think that uh if we have sound at the forefront of our training we have some kind of ideal we're going to miss a lot of the individuals we work with because yeah. you're going to not find their unique timbre and some some are brighter some are darker some are in between so i think that that a thing that we should encourage is more of an awareness of of the sort of functional um uh inter um intersections of, of breathing of vibration of the vocal fold level and of resonance and articulation um and then enjoy the result it's such a great result and you get all these different individual sounds that that i think are so wide and vast you can't predict so i never predict a timbre or think that anything's 
and more beautiful than another. I think it's this highly individual voice prints that a person has. Amen. Um, with hearing and listening, and that is that our ears are all wrong. They should be sitting up front. Yes. So they hear how it sounds, but they are sitting here, and the, the sound doesn't uh, scatter very well. It is the low frequencies that are um, uh, more successful than the high frequencies there. And also, when if you are going to um, guide yourself by what, how it sounds, so the sound of your own voice, you are mostly getting very, very depending on the room acoustics. If you go to the bathroom uh, and have reflective walls, it sounds quite different from if you go into the wardrobe and sing the same song there. Mm -hmm. uh, a weird idea, but anyway, you could try it. Uh, so, um, therefore, going for how it sounds in your own head is a bad strategy. It is much more uh, valuable and meaningful to uh, analyze how it feels in your, in your, th your voice. Ah. And I just wanted to add one thing there that uh, complements what you both said, that uh, uh, feedback by listening to what you produce with your voice is very slow and it doesn't allow to correct and set up the right uh, coordination you need to sing. So you must rely more as a singer and a performer on your kinesthetic awareness of the voice production rather than your um, uh, hearing perception because what you want is to be an athlete ultimately an athlete of coordination and to be an athlete of coordination you need to feed forward your system and not to provide feedback to your system you will be dead if you do that on stage so you know to know where you are going before you are leaving for that target it is uh, it is important like no ronaldo ronaldo like ronaldo the football player he He's so good yeah, he knows in his head, he sees the trajectory of the ball before he scores the goal. And he trains uh, when he's sh uh, shooting on the ball to get into the goal, they uh, switch off the lights on the, st the stadium. So he has to score with the lights off. So he has that kind of feed forward training to score goals. It's not feedback. Oh, the goal is the ball is going that direction. No, he sees it before, so he's pre-planning all the time. That is yeah. the goal of a, a singer and a voice, a professional voice user, to whom this day is dedicated, but uh, to the whole population, because actually we are a lot of us that need the voice to work and to communicate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's so important, and. and um, well, I was going to add uh, one other thing to the, the sound, the way it propagates, right? We have low end information that wraps around and you get to the ears. And then you also have bone conduction, right? And then bone conduction inside, it only conducts the low, in, low information. So singers, speakers are inherently uh, low end centric. And so anything you could do to enhance the room <laughs> seems like a good idea to the person speaking or singing. This is great, but it, it traps the sound inside and it ruins the, uh, the listener's experience. So. What comes outside. Hmm? Yeah. yeah. Good. So I think we had a wonderful conversation and um, I would like to say happy World Voice Day to everybody, despite the world scenario of COVID-19. Yes, happy World Voice Day. And celebrate it. Yes. Woo! <laughs> that was fun. <laughs>